Hello, my dearest Martha. How can I describe to you the events of the last several days? It has been absolutely dreadful here at sea, and I fear that this letter will fail to reach you safely. I fear not for myself now, not now that I have seen it. I would be indebted to Neptune, to Poseidon, to Almighty God above, if I could just die safely on land. But I fear that my fate is sealed here on this ship. If by providence I do make it to Britain safely, then I know it will be some time before I return. That thing that I have seen will continue to haunt me in my worst nightmares, and I would scarce even look at a ship or step foot in the sea for fear of encountering it again. Oh, but Martha, I cannot be apart from you, and I would die before risking your safety to such a thing. No, my dear, if I make it to Britain, I will return to you again, but I must take another way, and I fear I will be much delayed before I see you again. My love, you must think I'm mad. I think of how frightened you must be to hear me now. Forgive me, Martha. I have forgotten myself. I pray, Martha, if you love me, trust that I am not mad. Trust that what I tell you is true. Or if you cannot trust yourself, then trust through me and through our love for one another. And do not be afraid, either for my safety or in what you read. I know much of what I am about to relate will be frightening, and it may seem impossible. Our love will brook no secrets, and if this letter reaches you safely, know that all the worst has passed. I boarded the SS Baltimore Maiden on the 12th of May. By nature of my position as a clerk, I was able to afford more comfortable lodgings. I know the conditions of those confined to the lower decks, and it does much to make me grateful of my meager accommodations here on this vessel. I was even fortunate enough to dine with the captain on four separate occasions. Captain Baird is a good man, of decent upbringing. He does not curse or swear, and there is no foulness in either his language or his demeanor. His hair is neatly combed, and his beard is well trimmed, and he is always dressed smartly. He treats the passengers well enough, and is a man well accustomed to his craft. He has sailed the ocean since he was a young man, and I could not trust another man to better captain a ship or sail me safely across the Atlantic. The crew, too, is worthy of some admiration, although I would never let any of them enter your presence or enjoy one sweet moment of your company. They are harsh men, with vulgar tongues and a lack of respect for the fairer sex. I have seen how they harass some of the women from the lower decks, and it sometimes takes all of the captain's efforts to restrain them. Every last one of them is a scoundrel, excepting the first mate and a couple of the other more respectable crewmen. But each one of them is a fine sailor, and trained well in the profession. Our ship has sailed safely through storms and treacherous waters, as if it weren't sailing but rather flying on the wings of an angel. Whatever else I might say about them, that is no small feat. I must confess to you, my love, to my shame, that I was a weaker man than what I appeared, and I suffered from seasickness for almost two weeks. Despite the best efforts of the captain and crew, I found myself nauseated by the motion of the ship and at the mercy of the waves. It is a silly thing, and I know my father would laugh at me, but I swear I spent the better part of a week bent over the railing, sick to my stomach. Oh, but I forget myself again, and I should not speak of such vulgar things. That is how I met the captain, however. He took pity on me and invited me to dinner, provided I could keep it down, and I was determined to give it my best effort. The captain treated me well, and my dinners with him were the finest I have had on my entire voyage. He even surprised me with fine wine at our first dinner and every dinner after, save one where he produced a bottle of champagne. I found him to be a well-educated man, too, versed in matters of politics, history, mathematics, and philosophy. We had a highly enjoyable time discussing current affairs. He seemed to know better what was going on between the parties than Edmonds and Beck did. He would always light a pipe and go into a long rant about the failings of one or both parties, and I do believe that if we could only ruin his character in some great measure, that he would be one of the finest politicians ever to grace the halls of Congress. I did enjoy my time with the man, but on each occasion when we dined together, he would make an effort to spoil our leisurely discussions. Despite his good nature and remarkable education, he had a peculiar habit, or rather an insistence, upon darkening each dinner with a few of his strange sailor stories. I thought he would be too intelligent to be so superstitious, but he never saw an issue. Indeed, he seemed to believe more fiercely in his superstitions than the sailors did. He would always let the lights burn low, casting an almost eerie glow across the cabin. The gas lights would cast dancing shadows across the room that he seemed to almost weave together into his stories. Each time I thought I would leave early, but it always seemed like poor manners, and despite myself, I would always end up hanging upon his every word. He would talk about whales that glowed in the dark, or dolphins made out of pure gold, crustaceans as big as houses, or squids that were big enough to drown whales, 
He never spoke of mermaids or sirens or the other sorts of creatures I expected to hear from such stories, but he told tales of fantastic creatures nonetheless. He even seemed to believe them. I mean really believe them, as if such things weren't impossible. He would always start each story by saying, have you ever heard of such and such? And at the end of his stories, I would always tell him that it was impossible. But he would only give me a sad look and shake his head slowly, or let out a long puff from his pipe. It was maddening, absolutely maddening, to think that a man who believed Newton could also believe in such tall tales, and to think he expected me to believe him. Well, <laughs> I suppose I am too hard on the man. He never did expect me to believe him, or else I never would have returned to dine with him. Still, my dear Martha, the man would tell such unbelievably tall tales. On my first dinner with him, he told me of a bird as big as a wagon, with a wingspan of over fifty feet. He claimed to be sailing around South America at the time when a bird with bright blue feathers and a ruby head attacked the ship. He said that the bird could beat its wings and rock the ship about violently and knock men to the ground. The bird would rock the ship with its wings and then pick out whichever sailor was unlucky enough to be within reach of its talons. It would eat one before flying off towards land with the other. This ordeal lasted for a full week before the captain of that ship decided to spear through the harpoon. My captain, Baird, he was dumb enough to volunteer and try and spear the creature with the harpoon. He managed to pierce the beast's foot and tie it off to the deck, but the animal panicked and flew towards the shore, dragging the ship behind with it. Baird was caught up in the ropes and barely managed to cut the animal loose in time to save himself from being carried off with it. I half expected him to say they sailed too close to land to avoid Charybdis. In another story, he told me about how one night out at sea, when he was only 17, the waters were calm enough to look like a mirror. He told us how the ocean looked like it was filled with diamonds, and the moon looked like pure silver. He reached down to the water and pulled a diamond out of the ocean, but in his carelessness he dropped it. When he reached out to the moon, he said he was able to touch it, and it was cold and smooth like silver. The heavens above him seemed to grow closer to him, and before long he found himself surrounded by stars as they danced around him like fireflies, and the stars formed around him into the shape of a woman, and he danced through the night with the stars. It all sounded so ridiculous that I thought he was about to say that he had been taken up into the heavens and made one of the constellations. I told him that he had been dreaming, and that he was full of it, and to my surprise he grew quite red, and I was afraid that he would lose his temper. But he just sighed and shook his head, and let out a puff of smoke. The only one of his tales I can recall that I thought was even remotely believable was when he was sailing to France, and he spoke of a fog that glowed a ghostly green. He told of another sailor who claimed it was ghosts coming from their souls, and how he had told of a whole fleet of ghost ships that had attacked him. But Baird was quick to assure us that it was no ghost story. He said that it had given the crew quite a start, but it turned out to be only phosphorus gas. I almost respected him for his dismissal of the superstitious sailor, but he claimed that he was only convinced that it hadn't been a ghost because he had encountered ghost ships before. He told us all sorts of tall tales and fantastical stories, and many of the people present at the dinner believed him, or at least humored him. They would urge him to continue in his nonsense, and he would tell them even more tall tales about flying ships, storms that never dissipated, fish with human hands instead of fins, and shores of gold, silver, pearls, and fine jewels. He spoke of all these things and more, things that would baffle the imagination and insult the intelligence. And he spoke of them so carelessly, as if they were as ordinary as the sunshine or the rainbows. He captivated a good number of the passengers in this way, and they were always gossiping about his stories and adventures. I, for one, never believed a word of it, and would even challenge him on the particulars of his stories on multiple occasions, saying that they defied logic and reason. He never seemed to care one bit. I think it may have bothered him deeply. But if it did, he never spoke of it. In fact, far from alienating me from him, he seemed to take a liking to me because of my skepticism. Few were invited to dine with him more than me, and he always seemed to be in good humor whenever he greeted me. I say that I dined with him more than most, and despite only having dined with him four times in the entire journey, it is indeed true. The captain is a very personable and friendly man, but he does seem to value his privacy, and chooses to dine alone most nights. Our last dinner together was four nights ago. There were several other passengers with us, including the husband and wife in the lower decks. This seemed to be offensive to the lady from Virginia, but the captain refused to hear anything of it. On that particular evening, when the lights had burned down low, he began to tell his wildest tale yet. He told us of a storm that lasted for a fortnight. On the tenth day of the storm, he told us that it seemed to come alive, that it grew arms and legs and terrible red eyes as it assaulted the ship. He told us it picked up the boat and played with it as if it were a toy before tossing them into a giant wave. He told us his story with such earnestness, such sincerity, and I laughed at him. I laughed. 
Can you believe it? Can you believe me? Oh, Martha, how foolish I was not to believe him. Oh, but I believe him now. How can I not? After everything that has befallen us, I cannot help but believe him in every detail. After what I saw, after that thing that I saw, what could be more unbelievable than that? Oh, how I rue laughing at him now. If he carries us through this, I shall never laugh at him again, nor any other sailor, and I will let Baird roundly mock me for my skepticism. Oh, Martha, I feel faint, and I feel as if I should stop now for fear of the thing that has assailed our vessel. It terrifies me, and fills my bones with horror at the thought, and I do not know how I am to relate it to you, or even if I should. Ah, but I cannot stop now, or else I may never have the courage to speak of it again. I do not wish to share my fear with you, Martha, but there is nothing hidden between us, and our love will brook no secrets. Oh, but I tremble to even think of it. I can only pray that by sharing you the harrowing details, that it will help alleviate my fears of that thing. It was three days ago when it all started. The waves grew to be twice as tall as the mast, and our ship was thrown about by the waves. My nausea returned, and I found myself sick at the sight of the ship the entire day. The vessel rocked back and forth so violently that I feared that it might capsize, and I and many of my fellow passengers spent every moment not already committed to illness in prayer. I was unable to sleep that night, and it took me well into the next day before I was fully adjusted to the extreme motion of the ship. Looking back, my dear, I would give almost anything to only be at the mercy of the waves again. Two days ago, our troubles began to multiply, as a fierce storm set in and began to pour down all around us. It rained so heavily that I could scarcely see ten feet in front of me, and it is a wonder that we did not sink or crash into something. I feared that our ship was doomed, but the captain was determined to keep the ship afloat, and it has stayed that way, if by nothing other than the sheer power of his iron will. Even still, the storm threatened to sink us, and the lightning and howling winds have been so strong as to keep sleep from all but the most exhausted on board our ship. Many had feared the waves as I had, and even some of the sailors seemed to be fearful of the storm, but none of the more senior members of the crew seemed to show any concern, just fierce determination to sail us through safely. It was not until yesterday that some of the more seasoned sailors began to fear that some evil fate had befallen us. This is because some of the passengers and crew have gone missing. It started slowly at first, one or two, but by the end of the morning six had disappeared. More and more have vanished since, and it has continued up until now. Even as I write this letter, more may have gone missing already. No one saw them disappear, and no one has seen any trace of them, but they are indeed missing. Of that there is no doubt. And though we know not all of what has happened to them, we know it has taken them. We know they have been consumed by that thing. Some of the passengers say it is the wrath of Providence, others say it is of the devil, and the sailors say it is the sea itself rising up to swallow us and bring us down to our graves. As for myself, well, I know not what it is, only that it is a great, monstrous thing, and that I am lucky to have escaped it so far, though I fear that will not last very long. It was not until earlier this evening that I saw the thing. I was above deck, trying to soothe my poor stomach when I saw it. I was not alone either, and it evoked such cries of terror and despair from the other sailors as to make me shiver. It was dark in the storm, and the only light came from the ship, or from the lightning as it struck and crashed around us. It was after one somewhat unassuming bolt from Cronian that I saw it. It was a giant arm, or claw, or tentacle. I cannot be exactly sure of what it was, only that it was a limb of gigantic proportion. It was easily fifteen feet across at its widest point, and it seemed to reach up and touch the heavens. It appeared to be moving slowly from what I had seen from the lightning but I was soon proven wrong. As soon as the light vanished from the bolt, the thing struck us. It reached out with its limbs and latched onto the woman to my left. She was not more than five yards from me. Her husband stood next to her, in shock, as the limb opened up and swallowed her whole, leaving a trail of ghastly slime behind it. The poor man let out a scream of agony and terror at the loss of his wife, and I stood there in horror. To my shame, I gave in to my fear, and I, with the rest of the people above the ship, began to scream and cry out to Providence to save us. We ran about madly, shouting in our panicked terror. Some shouted for mutiny. Others shouted to offer up one from below decks as a sacrifice to the storm. I was taken aback at the suggestion, but I was scared by how convincing the idea was in the moment. It is a strange thing, my dear Martha, how fear works a man over. I recalled the story of Jonah and the great fish, how the sailors had cast him into the sea to calm the storm. 
It seemed a silly notion when sitting in a pew as a boy. It was easy to call those sailors superstitious cowards then. But now that I have witnessed the same storm as them, and the same terror that the sea holds, it is much harder for me to condemn them. We would have gone on like that for some time if the captain hadn't stepped onto the deck to intervene. I do not know if he saw the attack. I doubt any man could have seen it and kept his sanity, much less his calm. But if ever there was a man, it was Captain Baird. He fired out a loud shot with his revolver that was heard even over the storm, and for an instant we were all shocked into silence. Captain Baird took advantage of the brief instant of quiet to calm us, or cuddle us, into silence, as it were. He looked completely undaunted by what had just happened, and he spoke loudly and calmly in an attempt to comfort the crew. There was grumbling and complaining, and still a shout or two from mutiny, but the captain handled it masterfully, calming everyone and ordering us below deck. Everyone seemed to calm, but to my shame I was bested by my own fear. I seized the captain by his shirt collar and shook him harshly. I said many things not fitting for a man of my upbringing, things that would shame the sailors around me. I cursed at him like one ready to rouse the leviathan. Oh dear Martha, I suppose I should not make such a wicked and cruel joke, but it is true. I was rather mad and I treated the captain harshly. I shouted at him and called him mad and demanded that he bring every gun to bear on that thing. By the good grace of Providence, the captain took it calmly, or at least more calmly than I deserve. He cuffed me and grabbed me fiercely and threw me up against the mast before showing me the foolishness of my actions. He spoke in a loud, strong voice, loud enough to be heard by everyone above deck, even despite the storm. He reminded me that the only gun aboard was his own, and that I would do well to mark and remember that fact. Further, he told me that even if the entirety of the British and American navies were to train every gun on that thing, that it would do little more than annoy it. He then released me and straightened my shirt before sending myself and everyone else but the most essential crew below deck. He gave us strict orders to douse all the lights, cover all the portholes, and remain as quiet as possible. I went below quickly, blushing with shame at my cowardly actions. I can only think, dear Martha, what you must think of me. I wish I had been a better and more courageous man at that moment, and I hope you do not feel too ashamed of me after reading this account. As I went down below deck, I turned to see the stern eye of the captain on me as the crew wrestled with the storm. It has been many hours since, in long silence. The captain and the crew have come below deck as well, and only plan to return above if it is necessary to keep the vessel afloat. And so I have sat, writing to you, my dear Martha. I have no light, and even my writing is muffled to the best of my ability. I would cease writing altogether, but it is only the thought of my betrothed that keeps me sane and holds fear at bay. For several hours it was too dark to write. Between having the curtains drawn tight and having no lamp or light from above, it has almost been pitch black, and I have had to count the hours by my prayers. Finally, when I could stand it no longer, I fumbled for my lamp to light it, but a terror came upon me. I felt as if the thing were still nearby, as if it were watching us for any movement. For fear of provoking the thing to wrath, I crept over to the porthole as carefully as I could. I was unsure if the captain had given his orders out of wisdom in an effort to keep us safe, or merely as a ploy to calm our nerves. But I was hesitant to test him. I was afraid that if I opened the curtains, even the tiniest crack, that it would alert the thing to our presence. I stood there for a long moment, but my curiosity could be contained no longer. I opened the curtains as much as I dared and peered out into the darkness. For a long moment I saw nothing, and I was about to shut the curtains again and light my lantern in order to write this letter. Then. Out of the darkness shone forth an eerie light. The storm was all about us, and the light was too bright to be the sun shining through the clouds, and it was too strong and consistent to be the lightning. It blinded me at first, but soon my eyes adjusted and saw what manner of thing it was. It was a monstrous creature with a long mouth and a head that was at least fifty feet long, and it appeared as if the tentacles that had been snatching the crew were a beard for the terrible creature. When it opened its mouth it sounded like lightning. It had long legs like that of a crab, except they were gigantic, and they seemed to stretch down for over a hundred yards. Its body was sharp and chitinous, like a giant shell, and it was greater than any boat on the Atlantic. All of these paled in comparison to the creature's eyes. Oh, Martha, if I could describe them to you, I would not. Oh, our love will brook no secrets, but my mind will not brook that terror again. Its eyes glowed bright, and it seemed to notice me. As I stared into the eye of that thing, it seemed to stare back at me. It stared into my very mind, and I swear I felt it. That thing, it was in my mind with me, as it stared at me with dreadful intensity. 
I tried to pull away, but it had a sort of paralytic, hypnotic gaze. I felt as if I was falling towards it. And then I saw it. I saw into the mind of that terrible creature, and I knew terror. I had one horrid glimpse at what that fit feared. Oh, Martha, I cannot describe it to you. I do not think it was made for the minds of men. As I stared into the mind of that beast, I saw into its very nightmares. I saw a monster greater than itself, one that will haunt me as long as I live. Thing, for what else can you call it? It was asleep, coiled in the depths, and one word rang through my mind like the scream of a banshee. Leviathan. Martha, dear Martha, the monster attacking our ship was as nothing compared to the Leviathan. I cannot describe it to you. The scriptures describe it. But to call the thing in Job Leviathan is to say that the ocean is big or blue. Perhaps the Lord did not describe it more fully because we could not fathom it. Oh, but Martha, I would not have to lay a hand on it to remember the struggle. And so the creature drew me in like a moth to a flame. I was coaxed forward by my curiosity and lulled into submission by the image of something more terrifying still. It was as if a serpent were to convince me that it was not dangerous by showing me a dragon. Almost too late did I realize my mistake. Fear of that monstrous thing before my eyes returned to me, and I threw the curtains closed in a terror. I hid in terror, fearing to make any sound or movement to alert the thing. It has stopped, and has not assaulted the ship again. But Martha, I feel it. I feel it staring at me. Even now, I am only able to write to you by the glow cast by its eyes. I fear soon it will find me and sink the whole ship to get to me. Oh, Martha, if only I could be back in your arms, safe with you. But it is too late for that now. My only hope, indeed all of our hopes, are in Providence and in Captain Baird. My dearest Martha, I have reached Britain safely. In all, 26 people were taken by that terrible thing. 19 passengers and 7 of the crew, including the first mate. But I have made it safely. I must confess that I doubted the captain would see us through, but he has brought us safely to our destination. I made sure to apologize profusely for my behavior to him, and as even more of a testament to his character, he forgave me instantly. I regret that I must voyage home with any other captain, for now I trust in no other man to bring me across the Atlantic safely. I have thought that it might be better not to send you this letter to hide my shameful actions. But our love will book no secrets, and I have no other explanation for my delay in returning. I pray that you can find it in yourself to forgive me of my cowardice, and for my long delay in returning to you. I promise you I will return as quickly as Providence allows. I must give thanks to God for bringing me safely across the ocean, and I must praise him for sending me a man as great as Baird. I am convinced that no greater captain sails the sea. Until I return, dear Martha, I send my undying love to you. Love affectionately, your dear Timothy Winthorpe.